Let me just make two quick announcements before we get going. Uh, this evening, uh, Susan Rice, the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, will diver, deliver a speech at New York University's Center for Global Affairs. She will detail how the United States is changing uh, the course of charts in the world. Uh, that is at 5.30 p.m. Uh, at the New York School of Law. And the second announcement, on Monday, President Obama will give a speech to the 110th VFW National Convention in Phoenix, Arizona. President Obama will be discussing our responsibility to maintain the world's finest military in the 21st century, to give our troops and veterans the care, the benefits, and the respect that they have earned. That is on Monday. And I think I'm relatively organized. Hmm? Uh, I don't think that's – I don't – He did. we didn't last year. I don't think that format uh, will be that way. Just a speech. Yes, sir. Report today that uh, Ambassador Eichenberg said uh, a lot more money needs to be spent, $2.5 billion. Uh, if there's to be success or progress next year in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. talking about development, civilian projects, uh, how's that uh, fallen in the White House? What kind of reaction has there been to that uh, that request? Well, Steve, as you know, the when the president first came into office, we conducted uh, an initial assessment of our policy uh, as re as it related to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, understanding, as the President had said throughout the campaign, uh, that we had under-resourced our efforts in those areas. Uh, he already requested $2.8 billion in assistance for Afghanistan. Uh, and the President certainly agrees that, uh, as he said during the campaign in, about our efforts in the Afghanistan and Pakistan region as well as in Iraq, that a military solution alone uh, was not possible, that we have to figure out how um, through using all elements and all tools of our national power, including development assistance, uh, how we can best uh, attain our goals in that region. Uh, as you know, uh, that review continues. The President ordered an increase in troop strength leading up to, uh, in Afghanistan, leading up to the important elections that will be held. Uh, in only a few days by the Afghans. Um, and we anticipate that an assessment of, uh, a further assessment by uh, uh, Ambassador Eikenberry and by General McChrystal will come in mid September after those elections. But in particular, this request that would nearly double, it appears. Well, I think the President wants to, uh, as I, I assume. Uh, both the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense want to evaluate not elements of but a package for uh, a different strategy for this region, which the President has long advocated. Uh, we'll, do that, uh, uh, we'll do that as part of a, an entire package. But I will say, uh, I, yeah, but I will say again, uh, you know, the President has, uh, has requested as part of that budget uh, a substantial increase uh, in, our, uh, in our assistance to that region, understanding, as he said, uh, in many speeches at the beginning of this administration, that uh, uh, we are we are going to have to build things. Uh, we're going to have to build. Um, we're going to have to build a civil society and a governing structure uh, in that country uh, as a way of winning uh, hearts and minds. Yes, sir. Robert, question on executive compensation on Friday. Some big companies like Bank of America, Citigroup, GM have to turn in their executive pay plans uh, right. for the Treasury Department. First question on that is, will that be made public? Uh, I don't believe so, but uh, you should ask uh, Treasury uh, for the specific, uh, the specific answer to that. But I'm not in the impression that's the case now. And along those lines, how concerned is the administration still about executive pay? Um, less than a year after the banking crisis. Banks are beginning to make money again, and it seems like they're paying some traders and executives a great deal. Is that still an issue uh, of concern? Well, uh, two things on that, Jeff. One, as you know, the President's – what he believes is an important proposal to give shareholders a say on executive pay. 
uh, that's had impacts in other countries is moving its way through Congress, and we're very pleased about that. We hope that's ultimately part of uh, legislation that gets quickly to his desk um, that will have an impact. Uh, secondly, the, the President continues to believe, as he has um, long before he got here, compensation has to be based on um, uh, not on reckless risk-taking, uh, but um, on uh, value that you're providing uh, and doing so in a way that doesn't jeopardize uh, your firm or taxpayers. Uh, that's what the President has talked about. I, I don't think the American people begrudge that people make um, big salaries, as long as they're not jeopardizing uh, the goodwill of the public in doing so. And I think that will ultimately be the test of, uh, of all of this. A couple questions. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you think it's unfair to say, but it, it occurs to me that if the President finds himself at a town hall meeting mm -hmm. telling the American people that he does not want to set up a panel to kill their grandparents, that perhaps they're, at some point, the President has lost control of the message. And I'm wondering if you, if the, if what you've seen in the last few weeks is one of the reasons why it was so important uh, to the President earlier this year to pass health care reform in the House and Senate before the August recess. Is everything that's going on right now what you feared would happen? No, I, 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 I a lot of ways to take this question. I'm trying to figure out which avenue to drive down. Um, Mm -hmm. Do you just say yes and go to the next one? <laughs> Certainly one way of doing it. Um, uh, the, l let me sort of uh, let me split these up a little bit. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of disinformation that's out there. Um, uh, we, we've, we've seen it. And look, let's be honest. Uh, you all, the media, tend to cover... X said this, Y said this, but some of you, but not everyone, does an investigation about whether what X said is actually true. Now, that's not, I'm not, that's not a blanket statement. Not every one of you is that way. We've called right. that panel's false. Right. I, mean, I don't know what more you want from us. Um, well, I don't think everybody's called them false. I think a lot of people have done stories about, again, it's he said, she said. No pun intended, because actually she said it. Um... I don't think there's any doubt that in some ways – look, I, do, I think some of you were disappointed yesterday that the president didn't get yelled at. Sure. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Were you disappointed the I was going to yell at him just for – just to, just to make – No, the president – No, the president wanted to have a what I think what happened, which was a rational discussion about um, – health care reform legislation. I think that's what ensued. Did everybody agree? I think the answer to that is obviously no. Uh, I think what the president said, which was important, is let's have a conversation where we talk to one another, not over one another. I'd, like I said, I do think there was some disappointment because a bunch of your stories had more to do with the fact of the, the sideshow on each side of the street outside than what was actually going on inside uh, of the town hall. Um, but we, we, Jake, going back to the campaign, we've always thought um, it more important to take disinformation that, that anybody may have about a proposal or uh, something that the president is trying to do and address directly that misinformation. Uh, I, I think that's uh, the most important thing. I, again, you know, the, the notion that um, did we always expect this was going to happen? I, 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 I said this before, I don't think the president's ever done a town hall meeting where everybody agreed with what he was proposing or what he said. I think the president believes that the town hall meeting is a structure where people can discuss those issues uh, in a way that they think, uh, the way that he believes. Uh, engenders a positive discussion. Um, 
I think that's what he gained yesterday. But is this what you feared would happen? Is this one of the reasons he wanted it passed before the August recess? No, I, the president wants to get through the process of getting something to his desk because delay now uh, simply means, as the president, I think, discussed very succinctly yesterday, it means delay means more people are going to get discriminated against on the basis of a pre-existing condition. More people are going to lose their insurance because they get too sick. Uh, more people are going to get thrown off their insurance because their employer can no longer afford to pay it. Um, that's the reason the president wants to see this done uh, as quickly as possible. Who decides uh, which of the many applicants for tickets to the town halls is actually chosen? Randomly by computer. Totally random. Mm -hmm. What about who gets a question? Uh, the president asks people to raise their hands and picks on them. For the stark difference in the scenes, though, I mean, we saw people were very polite with the president yesterday. They are, shall we yeah. say, less than polite with some lawmakers. You saw some lawmakers. Some I, don't, lawmakers I don't know that. I, I'll be honest with you, Cheryl. I'll be honest with you, Cheryl. I, I don't know how many town hall meetings you've been to over the summer. Been to that many, but I've watched the clips no, no. of a fair number of right. But I, but let's be let's let's just just dress that for a second. You've watched clips put up about certain segments of certain town halls in order to demonstrate yeah. the I'm consternation. Clips right. to know that the president didn't get that kind of treatment that some no, no, lawmakers I'm, got. I I'm just wondering. I'm just asking you to compare that to all the town halls that you've been well, to over the summer. Aside from that. The president didn't get that kind of treatment, and I'm wondering, do right. you think, is it just that people are more polite when it comes to talking to the president? Is it something in your, in the way folks are allowed into your meetings, or what, what's the difference? <laughs> again, I, I, I think, again, I'm sensing your disappointment that he didn't get yelled at. No, I'm, um, I'm not uh, disappointed. I'm just wondering what the, what the explanation is for it. I think people wanted to, I think what the, I, I can't speak to what, Again, I, I don't want to speak to what other town hall meetings because I only go to the president's. Uh, it's hard for me to uh, – I, I doubt we're seeing a representative sample of any series of town hall meetings uh, despite the food fight on cable every day. Um, but um, I, my sense is that people wanted to take the opportunity to find out from the president – uh, to have him answer their questions uh, about why he's doing what he's doing and the concerns they may have on the legislation. That's why when he asked, let's take some questions from those directly that have some concerns, I, at that point I think, you know, do you, want to, do you want to take that opportunity to have a discussion with the President of the United States about uh, what he wants to see on health care reform? I think most people took that opportunity as something that was uh, that was positive. I think it was a, a good conversation. I think the president thought it was a very productive conversation about the issues that we were dealing with. And as Jake said, we, 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 def we you know, the president, you know, went out of his way to bring up, in fact, some of the misinformation that turns out there in order to address it, because I think obviously he understands he has a pulpit that is um, large enough to deal with some of the misinformation that some people might not ordinarily ask or inquire about because they've read it somewhere and they just assume that it's uh, true, even if it's not. What does he think is the biggest obstacle to, to passing this legislation? The special interest. And the people that want to keep the status quo. The people that believe that somehow what we have is working for uh, the millions of Americans who are watching their uh, health care premiums skyrocket every day, who are watching small businesses drop their coverage, who are part of the 12.5 million people over the past three years that have been told by an insurance company in seeking to buy insurance on a private market that they're not eligible because of what somebody has decided there's a pre-existing condition. I think that would be what the president would believe is the greatest obstacle and has been for 40 years. There are people that, that have a vested in some sense, is monetary interest in keeping things as they are. Isn't it his fault, though, that he's not getting the message across? Well, well, well information. No, look, I, I, I don't think the president was under any illusion that with his presidency 
with the ascendance of his presidency, that would be the end of misinformation. I do think the president believes, look, I, I'm, I'm sure there, there are communications experts uh, that would tell you, well, anytime you're, you know, what's the old thing? If you're explaining, you're losing. Well, I think the president believes uh, these town halls provide an excellent opportunity to explain exactly what uh, his ideas and principles are. And more importantly, if he can affect misinformation by telling people uh, what isn't in a piece of legislation, I think he'll take that opportunity. Dan. Uh, in, in addition to the uh, town halls and the website to knock down these myths, is, is the White House um, considering other venues to try to correct the record, if you will? Uh, I don't, I don't it, it specifically. Uh, are, you, are you thinking of doing anything else, or is there the need to do anything else? Well, I mean, you know, we've got uh, uh, two town halls later in the week, one in Montana, one in Colorado. Um, and uh, then the president has, uh, he'll be back here for a bit and then uh, some downtime with his family. Uh, look, I don't doubt we'll take this battle up in, <laughs> in some earnestness in September, but I don't think there are any specific uh, venue announcements. Again, I think the president believes the format of the town hall in, in, in the ability to discuss directly with people what their, their cares and concerns are, he finds to be and always has been tremendously valuable. And is there any concern at all that if this misinformation <coughs> machine continues and, and the record can't be corrected as the White House would like it to be, that it could um, potentially make it more difficult to, to get health care reform across the Well, look, if the, <coughs> if the debate is dominated by something that's not true, of course. Uh, I don't think the president believes, though, uh, that when all is said and done, that, uh, uh, that most people will make their decisions on something that uh, is false and something that has been said is false. Um, but, uh, you know, I rant on cable a little bit, Dan, uh, as you, uh, in your exhaling, noted uh, in answering an, another question. You know, take a couple questions at a town hall meeting. You guys, Lord knows, have shown enough video of people with concerns about the bill, take one of those concerns and address its factualness. So, so do you think now that, that so much attention is being focused on the myths and well, I think debunking the myths, that that, in essence, will help you? I, I do. I think, if, I think if people believe for some reason that... Uh, this plan is government-controlled health care, which it's not. Uh, if the president can address that each time he goes out there and more and more people believe uh, the truth, then sure, that helps. I think that helps the prospect of millions to see health care reform this year. Yes, ma'am. It seemed yesterday the president, uh, speaking of disappointed, really wanted you soliciting tough questions and casting about for a real skeptic in the audience and, and not really finding one. And there was maybe well, one or two. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, I mean, right, I there was the one Republican that, and then the guy at the end. Right. I mean, I, I, I did read in a few leads yesterday afternoon that the president addressed skeptics of his health care plan, but I, maybe that was. Okay, maybe it was. 100% great. I don't know. It seemed that no, way. No, no, no. I'm just I'm, I'm pointing out that at least yesterday afternoon, th the perception among many of the stories I read was that the president had addressed some skeptics. Okay. In the, he was asking the audience, who's a skeptic? He was, seemed to mm -hmm. be soliciting tougher questions. Right. So to the extent that there weren't as many of those folks present as we've seen in other town halls, not necessarily yellers, but people who have legitimate concerns, is there anything that you guys can do going forward as you approach these town halls to get an audience that's more representative of divergent well, views? For example, I don't, I don't. Well, first of all, I don't have any questions. The president took yesterday eight. I don't know how many we'd say were people that were at least the last two because he took those from that. Uh, I don't remember. I guess the Republican was one of those two, right? The guy who said he didn't know why he was here. There was the gentleman. I think the third question. I was sitting on the left-hand side, so it would have been the right-hand side. A question about Medicaid and Lipitor. Um, I, again, I, I don't. That's at least three of the eight questions is not being. Um, they were in some ways skeptical. I, 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 what I'm saying is I, I don't. 
I'm not assuming that the re- the audience wasn't in some ways representative. Uh, again, I, I, I sense disappointment that, that he didn't get yelled at. Um, but uh, I think there were a number of people in there that had concerns and wanted to ask the president directly. I, I think we're going to continue to pick people randomly to come to a town hall meeting and, you know, they'll raise their hand and the president will ask. A smaller fraction of the audience, those tickets, as I understand it, go to the offices through elected officials. I think Bill told you guys to pull that on uh, like, Sunday or Monday. Yeah, right. smaller fraction. Would you cons- uh, but to Democratic lawmakers, would you consider in an attempt to have a more open debate, would you consider, for example, in Montana giving to the Republican Congress? Savannah, I, I, I think the the president feels very comfortable with the fact that he's having a representative discussion um, despite people's disappointment that it, he wasn't yelled at. Yes, John? No, no. I, I don't doubt that. Um, <laughs> you know, if you look at, if you look at the, the protests that, we're, that we saw outside of, outside of the building yesterday as a kind of a continuum from the, the tea parties and then the controversy over the birth certificate and then the, the, some of the anger over the Gates Crowley episode. You look back at that. Uh, one, I'm wondering. I have what to admit, Jonathan. I, let me just. Say, I, I I didn't go in the front door, so I don't know. I, I did not. See, oh, I don't doubt that. But I, I, I'm I'm saying I, I don't I don't know. I didn't see a representative sample of the signs. Just. Yeah. But what I was going to say is, uh, you know, this is a president who campaigned. Um, on the notion uh, that we could get beyond the partisan, war- the ugly partisan warfare of the last 16 years, um, and that uh, there could be, you know, rational discussion uh, that could bring parties together. And I wonder what happened to that. Why did the post-partisan presidency not materialize? Um, well, Jonathan, I, I, you know, again, I, I don't know if you were outside or inside, but. I think there was a rational discussion about issues not based on ideology or party uh, inside the town hall meeting. Um, look, I, it's not for me to... I, I can't tell you why somebody believes, uh, despite all preponderance of the evidence, that the president was born um, in... Uh, uh, was born here and not somewhere else. I... I <laughs> I've stopped trying to explain that. I did see a poll yesterday where 8% of the people said they didn't know if Hawaii was or weren't sure whether Hawaii was a state. So I don't know if that's caused some in, in, consternation. Among, in the south of the United States now, among identif- self-identified white-collar <laughs> workers, about a quarter of those people identify themselves as feeling very negative to this president. Uh, it's a quarter. I mean, obviously, the vast majority aren't saying that. But right. that... But it does seem like there's an emergence of, uh, you know, like I'm sorry, you said white collar? People who identify themselves as white collar workers. Um, There seems to be an emergence of a core group of, you know, people who feel very strongly negative, whereas at an inauguration, I think it was only 6% that said that. Well, look, Jonathan, I don't think the president ever believed that all the people were going to agree with him all of the time, uh, or even that all the certainly that all the people could even agree with them a majority of the time. Uh, I think you can have uh, the effort to talk about issues differently, to be to disagree on issues without being disagreeable about it, to have those type of discussions, uh, to talk about how we deal with the issues that haven't been confronted for years and years. I, you're still not going to get 100% of the people all the time. You may not get most of the people all of the time. Uh, I think the president will continue to reach out uh, to Democrats and Republicans for ideas, both in Washington and outside of Washington. Um, Continue to find a way to uh, bridge the differences that we have and seek common sense solutions. Uh, I think that's what he's tried to do uh, uh, since he's come into office. What individuals or groups do you think are the the biggest purveyors of the disinformation and misinformation that you keep mentioning? Oh, I I don't know. Um, Look, I think there's, I think you've seen uh, certain elected officials give out information that was wrong. You've seen 
uh, well, I, I, Sarah Palin gave out I, I, information that I think many of you all pointed out was wrong just on Friday. So I, that's one. Uh, there's certainly like countless other. Well, fair enough. That's uh, I, uh, I I promoted her, I guess, to uh, current Alaska governor rather than former. Uh, obviously, there are look. You watch. I watch TV. You watch uh, different groups that are coming to these meetings that are saying stuff that just isn't true. The president will continue, though, to try to address that. I think he thinks that's a positive thing, so that people that want to make an informed decision about this stuff will have all the information they need to do it. To what extent does he hope to, uh, shall we say, lower the temperature of the debate by doing what he did yesterday and, and going out again in the West uh, later this week? Well, I don't know that it's a, a lower the temperature. I think it's just a way of, a, a way of um, discussing this uh, in understanding that, agree or not, people are people rightly have questions, and the president's happy to answer those questions. And I think that's, I think he's again, he's always seen that, he's always seen this as a way of uh, town halls as a way of doing that. I think the president also came into office understanding and believing that, as I've said here many times before, that whether people agree with you or not, he thinks it's important to say, here's why I'm doing these things, here's why I'm making the decisions that I'm making, here's why uh, the issue that we're dealing with uh, is important for our long-term economic growth and laying that foundation. You know, I think he believes that... um, those that that type of uh, that type of continued dialogue with the American people is tremendously important. Joanne, following up on Jeff's question, it's been reported that the uh, executive compensation proposals that they will be made public at some point, but done in a way that prever- preserves the privacy of, of the individuals at these firms. Is that I, something that I, I, I don't know? I, I think Jeff's question was, and I don't want to infer the, the that. Were the proposals that were handed in by the deadline of Friday, were those simply going to be made public? I thought I doubted that, but I would check with did, you guys should check with Treasury on the specifics of that. On all the process. Yeah, I, 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 whether or not, I mean, I guess it, at some point, obviously, I think as I understand it, uh, Mr. Feinberg has up to 60 days to review uh, and make decisions about those, and obviously at some point, uh, that decision will be a public decision. But you're wrong in saying people are concerned that these high salaries and bonuses are being given while their tax money is being used and so well, on. I, I, didn't, I didn't say that there, there, weren't, there wasn't concern for uh, there wasn't concern for that. I said I didn't think people begrudged people making money if they're doing it in something that is uh, not based on a risk that's going to put somebody else's tax money in danger. Um, I, I think people don't want the President of the United States making uh, every business decision and every economic decision. I know the President believes that, no, uh, and I believe Oh, no, no, no. I, that's why the President talks about it. The President, look, the, the President didn't come at this, uh, uh, the President came at this upset as, as many taxpayers were in reading this stuff. Find out. Obviously, there's a say on pay that he's a big proponent of. But, but what he'd like to ultimately see some of some of the goals, and with the government having a, a vested interest now in, in in the firms that kind of that Ken Feinberg has jurisdiction <coughs> over, mm-hmm. has the president talked about needing to balance compensation restrictions with making sure that they're not at a competitive disadvantage? Well, I I don't know that it, I've heard him enumerate it quite like that. I think he has. Um, uh, uh, obviously, we've had a number of discussions about executive compensation and uh, ensuring that uh, more in the way of ensuring, as I said earlier, uh, that we don't have compensation that's based on um, outsized irresponsible risk taking. So, so the competitiveness is not a top concern. Uh, I, I think I've heard it mentioned, but I don't know that I've heard the president discuss something like that. The economics team in this administration and over here at the White House is there. A, is it important to see that, that 
these firms remain un uncompetitive? Well, uh, again, without getting into the specific compensation issues of these firms, obviously um, we have a monetary um, – taxpayers have a monetary interest in ensuring uh, that places like GM and, and others do well. Uh, that's not to say anybody's going to cut corners, but obviously uh, uh, we've seen banks already this year repay money. We've seen them repay with interest. Warrants on stock options have been sold in order to get money back to the government, and I think the, the president wants to see uh, uh, that money rightly returned to the taxpayers. Major. Will Chairman Baucus be with the president at the event in Montana? Yes. So they'll do it jointly. Is, uh, no, 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 no. No, I think he'll be he'll be in attendance. Uh, he's not an introducer, or uh, uh, he's he's just he's he's not a participant. He's uh, I guess he's been pre-screened. Right, right. But he won't be answering questions or anything like that. He's just there. He's just there. Okay. Uh, yesterday, the president said AARP endorsed the plan. As you're aware, yesterday AARP said it hasn't endorsed a plan. Where on the information or disinformation scale would the president's remark fall? Um, well, the president said, uh, well, I, ARP has said they are certainly supportive and have been for years on comprehensive health reform. Uh, I don't think the met president meant to imply uh, anything untoward. Uh, I think he discussed the notion that um, uh, AARP is supportive of legislation or I'm sorry an agreement that would um, that would fund uh, filling the donut hole for seniors as part of Medicare Part D as well as additional savings for comprehensive health care for them. the president is Dallas where AARP hasn't even endorsed the house pending committee legislation or Which is the what Senate I just legislation said. Right. right so he's aware of that so he uh, wasn't trying to mislead anyone no, he no. just misspoke right is that something that can happen in this debate that people can misspeak? Right, but not without intentionally meaning to mislead. Um, sure. I don't know if it's happened on uh, certain subjects, but yeah. Okay, so it's within the range of this whole discussion. Something can be wrong, but not necessarily intentional disinformation is what I'm getting at. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, think most of, I think most of what the president has addressed, though, has been in many ways uh, intentional misinformation. That he's been trying to correct. Right. Understood. All right. Uh, Senator Isaacson put out a statement yesterday also uh, taking issue with what the President described his position and his involvement in the end-of-life legislation in the House. Do you want to amend or correct anything the President said or you said about that? Because Mr. Isaacson has a completely different interpretation than the President used and you used yesterday. Well, he didn't have – he had no role in the House legislation. He opposes the language in the House. Well, I didn't say – let's this, take what I talked about on the back of the plane. and Let, let me just read what – let me just read the question, a series of questions and answers from Senator Isaacson. How did this become a question of euthanasia? Senator Isaacson, I have no idea. I understand, and you have to check this out. I just had a phone call where someone said Sarah Palin's website had talked about the House bill having death panels on it where people would be euthanized. How someone could take an end-of-life directive or a living will as that is nuts. You're putting the authority in the individual rather than the government, I don't know how that got so mixed up. Question two. You're saying this is not a question of government, it's for individuals. Senator Isaacson. It empowers you to be able to make decisions at a difficult time rather than having the government make them for you. Question three. The policy here, as I understand it, is that Medicare would cover a counseling session with your doctor on end-of-life options. Senator Isaacson. Correct. And it's a voluntary deal. I believe those are answers in response to his amendment in the health bill. Uh, not the uh, longer and, and more uh, de defined involvement of, of these end-of-life panels that's in the House bill. That's well, how it's been explained to me by his people, so I'm just wondering right. if... Well, I, I, don't, I, I, I would ask then those people to interpret... I just had a phone call where someone said Sarah Palin's website said uh, website had talked about the House bill having death panels on it where people would be euthanized how someone could take an end-of-life directive or a living will as that is nuts. Not my words. No, I, I understand. Yes. But so, what the president talked about yesterday was saying that Senator Isaacson had some role 
and well, I think the what the or develop the House I think what the president mentioned was implying that he it, supported it. And I'm just saying that Senator no, 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 that he had any role and he doesn't support it. Again, I, I don't think that's what the president was implying. I think what the president, I think the president mentioned that, that Mr. Isaacson had been in the House. That may have been some of the confusion. Okay. I think that's, uh, he was a member of, yes, did right. obviously represent uh, Atlanta suburbs before becoming this U.S. Senator from Georgia. Um, I, I think, what, again, what the president was trying to say was in this, was in a question about some of the misinformation, asked specifically about euthanasia and death panels. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think, I, I think, and I said this also on the back of the plane yesterday, I think what Senator Isaacson said, says in addressing that misinformation could not be more clear. That for someone to take, as he says, talked about the House bill, his words, not mine, having death panels on it where people would be euthanized, how somebody could come up with that, I'm roughly paraphrasing that sentence, is nuts. I'm not trying to yeah. read this into the ground, but he doesn't support the language in the House bill. You can have differences over. No, no, I understand. The, I, I, the, what I'm the, saying the is, I think there may be some end of life counseling is, right. and be clear to understand that neither of them calls for anything <clears throat> approaching. Right. I mean, look, I think the one thing that setting that aside for right. a second. I mean, again, what one he thing that back it, the House language no, I had no role in it. I and believes that yesterday there was comments from the president that indicated. I, I didn't read it. I certainly didn't read it that way, and I don't think my comments should be interpreted. Well, they, I didn't say that. So to interpret it that way would be to would be nuts. Um, uh, but uh, he's too sensitive. I, 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 again, I read what he said in an interview that was posted on Washington Post uh, dot com yesterday. Uh, I think if you go back and look at some amendments that he's offered and co-sponsored, right? But this he's offered and co-sponsored other amendments with Senator Rockefeller in dealing with uh, this. Um, I, I think uh, whether this is uncomfortable or not, I think uh, he and the president agree. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Rob. I want to go back to the earlier question um, about the AARP. And what he actually said was AARP would not be endorsing a bill if it was undermining Medicare. What exactly, how did he, can you <coughs> explain to me how he misspoke and what he meant to say? I think, again, what he's conflating is one, and I think if you ask ARP this, they have been supportive of comprehensive health care reform for a long time. They have not, as they said, endorsed a specific piece of legislation. They are supportive of health care reform, and they are supportive of an agreement that the Finance Committee and pharmaceutical manufacturers uh, have entered into that the White House agrees with that would use $80 billion to partially fill um, with reduced price prescription drugs, 50% of the donut hole that seniors fall into at a certain level as part of Medicare Part D, uh, as well as a, some of that additional money for savings in comprehensive health care reform. But he left the impression twice to anyone, or at least to me, sitting in the town hall meeting that Medicare, that ARP supported this, and he used Again, it to rebut the, the questions about whether Medicare benefits would be cut. So is he going to not do that in the Well, the hall? president's going to continue to say the bill doesn't cut Medicare benefits. Uh, I think, again, the president was talking about the, the agreement structured with uh, the Finance Committee and the pharmaceutical manufacturers. Can I follow up on the Senate Finance Committee? Uh, generally, or uh, sure, why not? Specifically, um, President complimented Grassley and Dean Snow yesterday for trying to get a bipartisan plan out. Mm -hmm. Baucus has also said he'd like a plan out by mid-September. Well, so, Senator Baucus and Senator Grassley said they wanted a plan in June. I know, but the point being, now they're shooting for mid-September. The president said he hoped to get a plan out. This was based on what he said yesterday. But he wants to get this done. Mm -hmm. So does there come a point where he wants this bill out out of the Senate finance alone, regardless of whether there's bipartisan support. Well, I, I don't want to get into uh, into those dates except to say uh, he's appreciative that uh, those senators on both the Democratic and the Republican side are working together. Uh, they're making progress, as they say, uh, toward an agreement, uh, and we're hopeful that they'll do so. Uh, that's 
the last of the ju committees of jurisdiction to uh, to finish a bill and ultimately head to both uh, well ultimately to go to the Senate floor obviously the House has done their work and can go uh, there as well Margaret subject entirely about the Medal of Freedom and if you would talk a little bit um, about if you've had any conversations with the president what he's told you about what that experience is like selecting an, ar an array of people that have made their mark on American society and, and perhaps have made a mark on him as well and I'm wondering specifically if you would talk about um, the impact of Sidney Poitier and of Senator Kennedy and, and why he chose yeah. them. Well obviously um, uh, the president wanted to pick those individuals that, um, uh, as the medal talks about this year, who are uh, agents of change. I think, uh, obviously, um, Senator Kennedy is somebody who, um, for decades in Washington, has worked to um, improve health care, to improve education, to help millions send their children to college. Um, I don't think there's a piece of legislation that has affected health care or education uh, in, in 40 years that doesn't bear some imprint of, uh, of his effort uh, in making the lives of millions and millions of Americans better, giving them opportunities uh, that wouldn't have normally existed uh, unless you were a member of a certain family or wealthy. Uh, obviously, there are others uh, in this category uh, that the president is honoring today. Uh, I think this, obviously, I think it means a lot to, to recognize the efforts of many of these individuals, somebody like Senator Kennedy, who's had such a profound impact on uh, on our public policy debates, and again, as I said, the outcomes of uh, so many pieces of legislation that have made a genuine difference in the lives of so many people. Anything about Poitier, and also, is there any chance, since Senator Kennedy won't be here today, that the president would have an opportunity to um, present the honor in person? Is that something that you talked about? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, I know his. Uh, I know Senator Kennedy's daughter is here today, accepting the award on uh, the award. Excuse me, on his behalf. Obviously, somebody like Sidney Poitier is somebody who, um, whose, whose actions broke uh, barriers uh, and paved the way for um, so many others and so many aspects of life. Uh, I think, obviously, the president is enormously grateful for, uh, for those efforts. Um, and for many that he will be uh, recognizing uh, Any today. Any second thoughts on Mary Robinson, given the opposition from Jewish group? No, I, I think the president is recognizing her uh, for her um, uh, for her leadership on on uh, women's rights and equal rights. And uh, as I've said before, he doesn't agree with each of her statements, uh, but she's certainly somebody uh, who should be honored. Robert, April. Robert, you know, you're talking about people who are breaking barriers and things that one the on the racial aspect, are you talking about Sidney Poitier, uh, Desmond Tutu, as well as Joseph Lowry today? But you know, this health care debate has boiled down to, in some parts of the country, into a racial issue. Has the president gone into that matter, looked at it? Has he talked about it? Has he called David Scott the swastika issue on his sign? David Scott has said, look, that this was not meant for me, it was meant for the president. But what, does, what does the president I, I, I haven't seen those. I haven't seen those comments. Look, I, I would say, I think I've said this here before. Um, I don't think there is a single act or event that we are debating or discussing right now, or have for at least as my memory, as long as my memory can go back, that should or could be compared to. Um, the tragedy of the Holocaust. I think whenever that's offered up into a public debate, um, it is a sign that things have gotten, for those that enter into it, completely out of hand. It has absolutely no place in the dialogue that we're having. We ought to be able, as the President said, have conversations with one another, not over one another. 
And the notion that we're having a public policy debate at the end of a spray paint can on somebody's sign, I think, is, uh, is ridiculous. And I think anybody, again, who, uh, who offers up that sort of analogy is, uh, uh, ought to be ashamed of themselves because they could not be more in the wrong. Should there be more sensitivity, not just on the Jewish component, but also on the, the ethnic component as well as talking about black, uh, Hispanic? I, I think the president would tell you, as he said countless times, and as I've repeated hundreds of times, we ought to be able to we ought to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. We ought to be able to have a conversation, even a debate about issues that are out there um, that don't result in. Um, the type of degrading comments or actions uh, uh, like you've referenced. Thanks, Essen.